Mr. President, I uh, am honored to join my senior senator today to commemorate such an important milestone uh, as he has described in American education. It was 40 years ago this week that President Nixon signed into law the Education Amendments of 1972, including a provision establishing for the first time the Basic Educational Opportunity Grant, which came to be called the Pell Grant for its sponsor, Senator Claiborne Pell of Rhode Island. Over the next four decades, Pell Grants would turn the dream of college education into a reality for millions of Americans. Today, more than ever, a college diploma is important to a young person's success. With the unemployment rate for those 25 and older with a bachelor's degree less than 4 percent, and for those and over 8 percent for those with only a high school diploma, the value of that college degree could not be more apparent. Higher education provides the skills and credentials that many employers require in today's economy. In the decades following World War II, the United States government made college and occupational mobility a reality for more Americans than ever before. Claiborne Pell was a veteran of that war, and he saw how the GI Bill enabled millions of his fellow veterans to better themselves through education. He recognized that many of his Coast Guard shipmates had just as much talent as his Princeton classmates, but not the privilege or resources to go to college. And given the opportunity, this greatest generation would not only provide a better life for their families with that access to college, but they would contribute mightily to the growth of this nation, a growth that we still enjoy today. Claiborne Pell resolved then that all Americans should have such an opportunity, and his vision would become a reality for millions through the Pell Grant. In 1976, the first year the Pell Grants were fully funded, a full Pell Grant paid 72 percent of the cost of attendance at a typical four-year public college. Today, a full Pell Grant covers just 32 percent of those costs, but still, for many, this vital assistance can mean the difference between being able to attend college or not. As grant aid has fallen and tuition has soared, families have had to borrow to make up the difference to send their kids to college. The total amount of student loan debt carried by Americans has recently surpassed $1 trillion, more than Americans now owe on their credit cards. I've talked to students around my state and I've read many heartfelt letters. It is clear that Pell Grants serve as a gateway to the opportunities available with a college degree, a gate that would be shut if not for Pell Grants. I received a letter from Phil in Wakefield, Rhode Island, the oldest of five children. Last year, Phil graduated from Cornell. Phil worked his way through college, including summers. His parents chipped in when they could. Phil's father is actually still paying off student loans. And Phil was lucky enough to earn private scholarships and receive grants from his school. But he said, there's no way my education would have been possible without Pell Grants. We just wouldn't have been able to afford it. I also heard from Anthony, who's been working as a waiter in Providence. Thanks to the Pell Grant, he and his wife, Jen, have been able to go back to school at the University of Rhode Island for degrees in biotechnology. They say their education will enable them to build a better future together in Rhode Island's rapidly expanding biotech sector. Leanne is a single mother of two from Pawtucket, already carrying student loan debt, although she hadn't been able to finish her undergraduate program. Last year, Leanne enrolled in the School of Continuing Education at Roger Williams University, and when she graduates with a bachelor's degree next year, she plans on opening her own small business. None of this would be happening, she wrote, if I were not receiving a Pell Grant. The simple fact is this. Pell Grants help millions of people achieve the dream of college and improve their prospects for employment. It is a wise investment in the future of our country. 
Congress has in recent years increased the buying power of Pell Grants, increasing the maximum grant from $4,050 in academic year 2006-2007 to $5,550 in 2012-2013. We also increased the minimum family income that automatically qualifies a student for the maximum Pell Grant, a change that better reflects today's economic realities. But sadly, we are seeing a truly misguided assault on Pell Grants. The editorial board of the Wall Street Journal marked the 40th anniversary of Pell Grants this week by printing claims about the Pell Grant that simply, to be polite, Mr. President, do not withstand scrutiny. The journal sells, says that the Pell program is rife with abuse with students engaging in, quote, creative accounting to qualify by feigning financial independence. Well, the most common way you get deemed independent under the Pell Grant program is by being 24 years of age or older. Hard to imagine doing much creative accounting with your date of birth. The other major proofs of independence are being married and having children. Maybe when they said creative accounting, they meant procreative accounting. The Wall Street Journal implies that better off students can win larger grants by attending more expensive institutions. But the cost of tuition cannot increase the maximum size of a grant. The maximum Pell Grant, as I said, is $5,550, regardless of the school you attend. And as we all know, $5,550 is far from sufficient to cover the cost of most higher education. Perhaps the most misleading claim from the journal is to pick out the period when Pell Grant costs rose significantly between 2008 and 2010, due largely to the enactment of a funding expansion that has since been repealed, and the fact that more eligible students applied for assistance as the economy worsened in those years. What they left out is that the Congressional Budget Office projects almost no average annual growth in program costs over the next 10 years. The Republican budget in the House of Representatives slashes funding and eligibility for Pell Grants and eliminates all mandatory funding for the program over the next 10 years. We all understand the need to find savings in the federal budget. We all understand the need to make difficult choices. But of all the bad choices we could make, of all the unintelligent choices we could make, failing to invest in Pell Grants would really be among the worst. It is frankly shameful that federal financial aid has not kept pace with the rising cost of college. And it is truly misguided to roll back financial aid for a generation of young Americans preparing to compete in an ever more global economy. We need a highly trained workforce. And Pell Grants are very often the keystone in the arch that students must build to afford college, as Phil and Anthony and Jen and Leanne all showed. Mr. President, Rhode Island is a small state, but over the years we've had some towering and remarkable senators. Claiborne Pell was one. Claiborne P Pell believed, as he once told the Providence Journal, that government and the federal government in particular can, should, and does make a positive impact on the lives of most Americans. The Pell Grant's positive impact is that people who can't afford college have the chance to go to college and it lifts off their backs a little bit of that burden of debt. That is something, Mr. President, that we want in this country, not just for the sake of the individual Pell Grant recipient, not just for the sake of the next generation, but for the sake of the good of our country. I thank the presiding officer and I yield the floor.